Is that better? Oh man, Zoom technical challenges right when you start. All right. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second session of the 2024 Conservation Research Program Final Student Research Presentations. My name is Erica Groot, and I'm the Director of Research for the Institute for Integrative Conservation, or the IAC, as you'll hear a lot today. And I have been lucky enough to get to work this year with an incredible team of William & Mary undergraduate students, faculty from across departments, and external conservation partners who have completed applied research designed to advance conservation outcomes. Today, we will have an opportunity to hear how this student-led research is informing conservation solutions. Thank you for joining us. In the face of rapid loss of species, climate change, and environmental degradation, there is an urgent need for us all to come together to build bridges across sectors, disciplines, and among communities to develop solutions to ensure both humans and nature thrive. The Institute for Integrative Conservation was established in 2020 thanks to a generous alumna who recognized that William & Mary was well-suited to meet this call for action. Our mission is to empower an inclusive community of leaders to deliver timely and integrative solutions to the world's most pressing conservation challenges. And the IIC's conservation research program is one of our foundational strategies for realizing this mission. The year-long program matches William & Mary undergrad undergraduate students of varying majors, local students from the areas where the conservation work is being done, William & Mary faculty from across William & Mary's various schools and departments, and external conservation partners to complete applied research proposed by those external partners as needed to advance conservation outcomes. This year, we have 26 William & Mary undergraduate students, four young professional students from the areas where the conservation work is being done, 14 faculty mentors, and 19 external conservation partners working together to complete 15 applied conservation research projects. These inter interdisciplinary teams tackle a diverse range of projects that span natural and social sciences, as well as humanities. And the students involved in these programs, like I've said, have a diversity of majors. Last spring, the students worked with their faculty and conservation mentors to develop a research proposal. Over the summer, they traveled across Virginia and the globe to complete this research full time, and now they're wrapping up their research, writing a report that they will give to their partners so that they can implement those actions from the research. This morning, we heard from nine students about their research project. This afternoon, we have an opportunity to hear six presentations. Most of the presentations in the morning uh, were had international partners and international focus because we had international partners joining via Zoom and didn't want them to stay too late. So this afternoon, the projects are mostly local projects. So we do have one international project here that you'll be hearing about today. After these presentations, we invite you to a reception in the Hive Work Cafe, which is just around the corner, where we'll have lots of good food. So please, please join us for that reception. And to save time, please hold your questions for the students for that reception. After each student presentation, I have asked their conservation partners or faculty mentors to pro provide a brief reflection on their important conservation work. Today's presentations are being recorded and will be uploaded to the IIC's YouTube site. Please feel free to come and go. I know it's a little bit hot in here, so feel free to come and go as needed, um, but please do so quietly. The bathrooms are around the corner and there's also water in the Hive Cafe if you, if you need it. Before we begin, I want to thank all of the amazing external conservation partners for inviting William and Mary to join you in your important conservation work and for all that you did to mentor the students on their research and for helping them to explore careers in conservation. I'd also like to thank the incredible faculty mentors for guiding the students through their research. And I'd like to especially thank Camille Andrews, the William and Mary Research Librarian for all that she has done to guide the students to this work. I'd also like to thank the IAC team, especially Kathy Francillo, for all of her important work handling all of the budgets, travel, and other logistics, which made this entire thing possible. 
I would like to thank all of the students for all of your hard work and commitment to conservation. And finally, would love to thank you all for joining us here today and for being a part of this incredible IIC community. Thank you. <laughs> all right, before we begin, um, I am going to invite Leah Weinrob, who is on our Student Leadership Council here at the IIC, to give our land, the William & Mary land acknowledgement, and then we'll introduce our first speakers. Leah, thank you. William & Mary acknowledges the Indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the lands our campus is on today. The Cherokee, oh, Cheronaka, not away, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Wadapanai, Monacan, Mansamond, Nottaway, Monkey, Alawomek, Wadapanai, and Nottahannock tribes, and their respect to their tribal members is present. Thank you, Lena. First up, we have Caitlin Potts and really quickly, uh, Raquel Manojana, who worked alongside Professor Dave Waldeen and Rainforest Trust to explore the potential of IUCN Red List as a tool to monitor collaborative conservation impact. In the field of conservation, our goal is to generate success by maintaining stable ecosystems, preventing critical preserving critical habitats, and preventing species extinction. However, sometimes it can be difficult to measure conservation success and communicate it effectively between conservation organizations and their partners. My name is Raquel Mondohana, and this is my research partner, Caitlin Potts. Our project is composed of two parts. I will be talking about how organizations can work together to monitor conservation impact, and Caitlin will go into how we can use the IUCN Red List to meet this goal. Our partner is Rainforest Trust, and Rainforest Trust supports local partners to establish new protected areas by funding land purchase. These protected areas protect highly threatened plant and animal species in rainforest habitats around the world, and Rainforest Trust came to us to help them find a way to measure their conservation impact, focusing on identifying specific successes with species found within the reserves across their portfolio. So tracking success is a challenge when working with a variety of partners that have different conservation goals. So our goal for our project is to collaborate with Rainforest Trust to address knowledge, capacity, and resource gaps related to the evaluation of conservation impact on species. And my objective is to strengthen the measurement of collective conservation impact by Rainforest Trust and partner organizations. So we were connected with two of Rainforest Trust partners in Ecuador, Poco Toco and Ecominga, and had the opportunity to visit them this summer. We visited several of their protected areas and talked to them about their conservation goals and strategies regarding species found within the reserves. From our conversations with Hoko Toko, we learned that they look at impact on species they have already identified within their protected areas, and Ecominga told us that they want to expand their impact to include species whose conservation status isn't known, and this includes species that they are still discovering within the reserves every day. So while there is clearly alignment across all three organizations in their broad species conservation goals, their approach and specific priorities relating to measuring conservation impact differ. So the question that we left Ecuador with was how can we get these three organizations to track their conservation success? So there's this gap in understanding each partner's current goals and conservation priorities. And this inspired us to create a survey to, to send to partners on behalf of Rainforest Trust um, to get updated information on their conservation work with species. So each survey entry was designed for an individual species and questions ranged from basic data about the species to current conservation strategies to ideas for new approaches. So the next two slides I will share are examples of questions and responses from the survey um, sent out to around 20 of Rainforest Trust's partners. So when asked 
which are the following examples of conservation actions their organization is currently implementing for their species. You can see that the majority said monitoring for the species. And when asked what the suspected population trend within Rainforest Trust funded reserves are for these species, surprisingly, the majority said that it is un currently unknown what their population trends for the species are. So what does this all mean? So our initial goal for this survey was to gather information about partners' impact on species and to use it as a way to open communication between Rainforest Trust and partners um, from these, but, but from these two question results, we can see that there's still even a gap within the partner organizations, a gap in knowledge. So if monitoring is a primary action, shouldn't this coincide with more certainty regarding population trends? This is one of many examples of ways that we can use the survey to interpret any drawbacks or things that need to be worked on within these partners. And Rainforest Trust can use this survey data in multiple ways, especially working to fund new protected areas and ensuring that their partners have the capacity to be able to gather this information that is important, and also to work with current partners in their reserves to see any ways that they can help them to collect this new information. So then, um, this survey has the potential to strengthen communication between Rainforest Trust and the partners um, to gather updated information about species that they are helping and learning about ways these species are and can be conserved for future projects. So I want to start by having you all take a look at this photo, which I took from the side of the road within Canada Reserve, and we can see really dense, well-preserved rainforest here. This photo was taken from the side of the very same road about two miles down, and this one is outside the boundary of that reserve. And so using things like these photos, it's really straightforward for Rainforest Trust to track the impact that their work has on the lands they're protecting. Um, something that's a little bit less straightforward, though, is understanding how this work impacts species that live on that land. And one tool we can use to do this is the IUCN Red List, which tracks species extinction risk and sorts them into categories of uh, threat categories, as you see here, based on quantitative criteria. And so we can understand how a species is doing over time by looking at how their category changes. And one way this can show us conservation success is through something called a downlisting, which is when a species moves from higher to lower extinction risk. So to help Rainforest Trust use this tool to more effectively track their success, we developed this objective of basically understanding how do they currently interact with the Red List and then moving forward from that to enhance that interaction to better track their impact on species. And to do that, we picked these eight focal species. These are all Ecuadorian plants that we wrote Red List assessments for as part of our project. And they can fall into these three main categories, the first of which are new assessments for rare species. And this category of assessment was especially important to our partners at Ecominga because they have a lot of uh, rare plant species in their reserves that aren't on the red list at all yet. And it's really difficult to get funding for protecting those habitats without an important uh, source like the red list saying, hey, these species need help. And so these two Lepanthes orchids, we wrote very first um, assessments for, and we're hoping those will help our friends at Ecominga get some funding to protect their habitat. Our second category of assessments are kind of the gold standard for downlisting, and these are based on genuine status change. So these two magnolias have been proposed for downlisting because of the extensive work our partners at Hokotoko have done throughout their habitat to mitigate deforestation threats, which has allowed their populations to recover significantly. Our last category are downlistings based on new information, and each of these four species had a new observation recently that impacted our understanding of the distribution, which allowed us to propose them for downlisting. One caveat here, though, is that we can't say for sure that their conservation status has improved. And this example is illustrated by an insight from our friend Lou Jost, who you see next to me on the right there. Lou has lived and worked in the Eastern Andes of Ecuador for the last 30 years, and he is an expert on most of the plants that live there. Um, he knows everything, it's awesome. But we asked him his opinion about a potential downlisting for this species on the left here, Zapoteca aculeata, because it's one of those from the previous slide 
that had a recent expansion of the species range. And so it looked like a good candidate for downlisting to us. And Lou told us, yeah, this species most likely will qualify for downlisting. However, it's probably doing worse now than it was back when the original assessment was done because he has seen firsthand this species habitat is in a decline over the last 30 years. And what we learned from Lou is that nobody has really looked for this species until very recently. And so when they did look for it and they found a new subpopulation, this does qualify the species for downlisting, which would appear to be a big conservation success. However, this is a little bit misleading given what we know about the species habitat, and we know that there's no active conservation work specifically targeted for this species. And so the downlisting in this case is really reflecting research and monitoring success of finding that new subpopulation rather than a genuine status improvement for the species. And so our takeaway here is that we really want to focus on genuine status improvements if we're trying to isolate an organization's impact. And Another kind of caveat with using the red list is that it can sometimes miss local successes, like this guy on the left, the Gregory McCall. Um, our friends at Hokotoko have this amazing reintroduction program with this species that has really helped its populations recover within their reserve. But we realized that this success would actually be missed by the red list because the red list is looking at this species stack over this entire international range and Hokotoko's reserves are only covering a small part of that range down here within Ecuador. So what we learned was that this success actually doesn't make a big enough difference to affect a downlisting, which means from a red list standpoint, this is going unnoticed. So our takeaway from this is that we really wanna be supplementing the red list with other important success indicators in order to more holistically understand the impact an organization is having on a species. And to wrap it up, the lasting impact of our project includes eight red list assessments, six of which our species were proposing for downlisting. We built relationships with our partners um, at Hokotoko Nico Minga. Fun fact, one of them actually wrote me a recommendation for law school, which is really, really cool. Thank you, Lou. And um, we've opened new pathways of communication between Rainforest Trust and their partners, really working towards bridging that gap and more effectively measuring conservation success. So thank you guys so much for listening. That's all. So much, Caitlin and I'm now going to read a, a brief reflection from Erin McCreelis, who was with their part, their mentor from Rainforest Trust. Raquel and Caitlin's research this year has made an invaluable contribution to Rainforest Trust and our efforts to conserve species. The students not only completed the first ever reassessments to move species in our project areas to a lower threat category on the red list, they also hosted compelling workshops with our in-country partners and helped us determine a path forward for assessing our conservation impact on many additional species globally. The students' investment in producing a high quality product to directly support Rainforest Trust is remarkable and hugely appreciated. I also would like to invite Professor Dave Waldina to reflect on the broader implications of their work related to red list assessments and their utility qualities. Can everyone hear me okay? Well, this is an amazing project from my perspective. I've worked in conservation for 25, 26, who knows however many years uh, that it looks like. But the two big take home messages from my perspective here is what they've identified, that communication is exceptionally important. They've done in this assignment or in this project was to help bridge communications between rainforest trusts and their country partners but it really opened up dialogue within those organizations as well. So the communications was a great uh, step forward. The other piece is the red list. Now here in the US, we don't really know and use the red list very much, but internationally, it's exceptionally important. And the work that they did, both Caitlin and Raquel, but also other students here at William and Mary, they've done this initial first step, come up with some amazing red list assessments, and now we're taking them the final step to be uh, published on the red list. This work is achieving and uh, catalyzing conservation on the ground. All this week from our trip down there to address the Ecuadorian uh, Vizcacha, a chinchilla, that is now going to go from data deficient to likely critically endangered because of this project and what this opportunity has given. So they've done a great job. 
And the CRP is a wonderful opportunity for the students and uh, the in-country partners. Uh, next, we have Grace Fogley, who worked with Professor Martin Gallivan and Jesse Jenkins, as well as the Nansaman Indian Nation, to explore their traditional and local knowledge related to climate and emergency management. And before we begin, I just want to thank Cameron Bruce, Assistant Chief Dave Henneman, and Chief Anderson from the Nansaman Indian Nation for coming and meeting with us here in person and for being here today to listen to all these student presentations and for being amazing partners. Really appreciate you being here. Hello, uh, my name is Grace Cogley, um, and I'm going to be presenting on um, Nansman-led emergency management. So um, you can see here on the title slide, I have a colonial map of southeastern Virginia, where the Nansman Indian Nation and where they have lived is underlined in red here, demonstrating the thousands of years they have spent in this region and the deep place-based uh, ecosystem knowledge they contain. Um, so moving on, my general conservation challenge that I focused on in this project was really how can I assist the Nansaman Indian Nation to better prepare for worsened floods and extreme weather events that they will be experiencing in the Hampton Roads region with the worsening of climate change? So climate change is impacting communities all over the globe. But specifically to the Ham specific to the Hampton Roads region, um, it has caused um, an increase in nuisance flooding. So that's that flooding you get with the king tide that's bringing the water onto the roads. Um, there's no rain or storms. Um, it's just the high tide that's causing that flooding. And currently, the Hampton Roads infrastructure is struggling to keep up with this level of nuisance flooding, storm surges, and extreme weather events. Um, and so as we see climate change worsen, um, the Hampton Roads infrastructure will continue to struggle and fail to cope with this level of flooding. Furthermore, the Hampton Roads region is experiencing a sea level rise that's nearly double the national average. Um, this is on par with the eastern seaboard, but specifically the Hampton Roads region is singled out as one of the worst, um, uh, has one of the worst rates of sea level rise along the east coast. This is due to a variety of factors from uh, the weakening of the Gulf Stream to land subsidence that's specific, again, to the Hampton Roads region. So, one of the main focuses of my project was traditional ecological knowledge. Um, so just to give a quick definition, um, that is just a uh, place-based knowledge that is deeply embedded within a community's daily lives, uh, ritual, practices, tradition, and religion. Um, so this is a body of knowledge that's accumulated over generations and thousands of years of living in the same landscape and interacting and learning about that ecosystem and passing that knowledge down through the generations. So you can see I have uh, two maps here, both of which show the traditional uh, lands of the Nansaman Indian Nation along the Nansaman River and also within the Great Dismal Swamp. So um, through this uh, research project, process, I conducted um, ethnographic interviews and ethnographic data analysis. So through this data analysis, I discovered five major themes. Um, so the first major theme I found was just that religion and specifically Christianity are really guiding a resilient mindset that helps people cope with the great deal of uncertainty that's found within these extreme weather events and um, natural disasters. So I have a couple quotes here up on the board to demonstrate some of the ideas that these um, community members had about this uh, um, resilient mindset. So a lot of community members I spoke with really emphasized how um, they could prepare for the worst and they could pray for the best, but whatever was going to happen it was probably going to fall somewhere in the middle. And they really used a deep-seated faith um, in God and a trust in him to be able to relax and sit in that um, uncertainty. Moving on to my second key finding, I found that the role of storytelling was really key in um, passing down this knowledge um, from generation to generation, but also to give a perspective about how things have been in the past and how people have coped with things in the past to give a better uh, trust in your own capability to handle things that are happening in the present. 
So my third key finding was those tangible preparation steps. So what can one do in the face of a hurricane to prepare? And what can one do in the aftermath um, to cope? Um, so moving on to my fourth key finding, um, overarching theme of this was just community and the importance of it. But I split it up into two uh, key elements. So my the first key element was just community as a whole. The um, Nansa and Indian nation uplifted each other and their entire community instead of their individual selves. And that leads into caring for the vulnerable, which is super important among this community is just making sure that those who are um, less able to care for themselves are still taken care of. Um, finally, my last key finding was um, a lot of uh, Nansaman Indian Nation members were really tapped into um, patterns of natural events that were happening around them. So this is emphasized by the uh, quotes I have up on the board. So just noticing things that are happening and what those consequences of those things may be and how to react. Overarchingly, I wanted to find out what the implications were for addressing uh, conservation challenges um, more generally. So I have uh, three key takeaways here. So my first one was just that communities living within disaster focus more on a resilient mindset rather than um, those action steps. The second one was that um, involving methods that don't appear to involve climate resilience but actually bolster community will in turn feed into that climate resilience. And finally, communities that have embedded networks of care such as the Nansaman Indian Nation. Um, researchers who are interested in, in bolstering their climate resilience really need to learn about and tap into those networks of care in order to properly support those communities. And, and I'd like to thank my faculty mentors, Dr. Galvan and Dr. Jenkins and uh, Cameron Bruce and Erica Garud. Um, thank you so much. Great job, Grace. Um, so I would like to invite um, Cameron Bruce sent me a nice reflection, but since they're here in person, I would like to invite Cameron Bruce up to provide a brief reflection, as well as Assistant Chief Dave Hanneman, if you'd like, and Chief Anderson, if you'd like as well, uh, but no pressure if you if you know their camera take the lead. So Cameron, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's been a real pleasure to work with Grace over the last year. Um, this is part of a larger climate adaptation and resilience effort for the tribe. So we wanted to kind of gather both some traditional ecological knowledge that we had at our disposal among the citizenry, but also gauge how the community feels about um, preparing for climate change, what their mindset was, and then how we can inform future efforts. So we will take this information and go through a holistic climate vulnerability assessment in the coming months with some other grant funding, and this will feed into that larger climate adaptation plan. So, um, like I said, it's been great working with Grace. One of the things that really stuck out to me with her was her respect for the community, both in how she allowed citizens to kind of guide the conversation and lead it in the direction that they felt was most necessary, but then also respect for, for the members of the government that she was working with. Admittedly, working with and for tribal government is is dynamic. Um, we wear a lot of hats and are very pressed for time. So she knew when to reach out when she had a burning question, but then also when to to kind of step back and make sure that um, everything was getting done. But actually, so I won't thank her again for her work. Thank you. I'm Assistant Chief Dave Henneman of the Nansman Indian Nation, and I served as the chairman of the Tribal Council as well. So that's that's a couple of big hats there. Very challenging. But part of the really reward to doing so much of what we do is to work with people like that. And Cameron, thank you for mentioning that because you're very correct. The respect that she showed while conducting her interview, each one of the people that she interacted with was very, very happy. And felt positive that the interest that she showed, the questions, and also speaking solely for myself, I'm pretty sure that I, she did not get what she needed from me. <laughs> I did guide the conversation. Um, but the amazing part to me about this, and I, and I have all the respect and appreciation and gratitude in the world for myself and on behalf of the Nansman Indian Nation, is the interest. The interest that someone would even want to reach out. And ask us these things. We actually 
put it in a format that would make sense to other people and that they can appreciate too. And we're really, really grateful for this. I think that actually I was the one that said that we were pretty laid back and didn't worry too much about it. And so I lived through a lot. And as I was speaking with Martin back on the back row, my mother would absolutely not believe it. What I have seen that happen in my generation so far is just the opportunity to stand here for people to be interested in what I'm working with knowledge. And we're very grateful for that vehicle. Thank you, Grace, because this was a wonderful presentation. Anything is what we can do with you. It's a small token of gratitude from the National Indian Nation. You know the grill. <laughs> what this is, this is a this is a little gift of what I want to have as a, as a little memory of for working with. Uh, it's what we call a spirit bag. It's personal items that we're doing. And I've added one that you'll be familiar with too. These are earrings, and basically the colors are the Nansman Indian Nation. And what I would like for you to do each and every time you ever put these in, put them in your ears. Remember that your ears are open to listen. Because that's a very important part of listening to us and, and taking them out of the You can have those. So we have Evelyn Hall and Rin Little, who worked with Professor Fernando Galeano Rodriguez and Professor Martha, Martha Case and the Biological Monitoring Group of Milta, Milta Alta, sorry, it's been a long day of presentations, to explore the applications of remote sensing and ecological monitoring methods to support community science in Mexico. I'm sure many of you enjoy spending time in, the, time in the woods, and it's easy to assume that these green spaces are healthy and beneficial to the environment, but that's not always the case. I'm Rin. I'm Evelyn. And we worked with the Biological Monitoring Group in Milpa Alta to look at man managing monoculture in Mexico. Um, so monoculture, which is also called green deserts, are areas of densely planted trees, which you can see a picture of here in Milpa Alta, compared to the much more sparse open areas of natural forest. Um, these densely planted tree plantations lead to depleted soil nutrients, um, increased vulnerability to disturbance, overall lower biodiversity because of the changing environment which leads to an overall loss of ecosystem services. The, this is where the biological monitoring group comes in. They were originally uh, commissioned by the Mexico City government to look at and monitor and protect the volcano rabbit and the Sierra Madre Sparrow. But in doing this work, um, they discovered the impact of plantation forests and started engaging in silver cultural management, which includes thinning trees and other uh, monitoring improvement activities. So while they're doing this work, other brigades are also continuing to plant plantation forests. So both of these things are happening at the same time. And this is where the monitoring, the biological monitoring group that we are working with, their need for large scale and in-depth data comes into play. One of the ways that we gathered this in-depth data was by using a process called remote sensing. If you've not heard it's the use of satellite imagery as well as computer programming to identify characteristics about a landscape remotely, which is in the name. Um, and in most cases, that happens from above. Our main question of the project was how can landscape level data and ecological research techniques support community led monitoring and restoration efforts in Alta, Mexico? We had three objectives um, for that question which included how remote sensing can be used to understand changes in land cover and land use. Secondly, how to identify and document ecological differences between landscape or between natural landscapes and plantation forests in Milpa Alta. And then lastly, provide some recommendations on how this work can be continued going forward by the biological monitoring group.
Our approach to these tasks is we started off with some geospatial analysis to get a general understanding of the area. Then we moved into developing a field methodology. Once we had that methodology, we used it in the field, shockingly, um, this summer. And then we did some analysis of the ecological data we gathered when we returned home and also used the information from our plots we the remote sensing models that we started at the beginning of the summer. And then lastly, what we're currently doing is looking at the differences in the light reflectance of these blocks. To gather just a little more information on how we can I begin a little bit deeper to the remote sensing stuff. I promise I won't get technical. Um, we started off by looking at pixels and whether or not they were forested or not. Going back in time, all the way back to 1985. And then looking at 2024, we classified these same pixels into um, different classes. We expanded upon the forest versus non-forest and we included grassland versus grassland slash agriculture, as well as developed land. And then as I mentioned before, we're looking at the light reflectance of these different types of plots using something called a spectral profile, which is what you can see right here. Um, the lines are representing reflectance. And then the takeaways from the, the steps we had prior were that we found out plantation forests are extensive, but they're fragmented and they're mixed in with the natural forests, which can make detection of these pretty tricky. On that same note, plantation forests cannot be remotely sensed going back in time, as I was talking about in 1985. We're using a type of imagery called Landsat that is 30 by 30 meter resolution. So if you think about having a square of land that's 30 by 30 meters, if half of it is natural forest and half of it is plantation, then we have to put it in one of the two categories. It's going to create some pretty noisy. Um, and then lastly, going forward, in order to make our classification models a little bit more accurate, we're going to have some more training samples from the field. So exciting things for the future, this project has some work to do. Now we get to dive a little bit into the ecological field data that we got in Mexico. Uh, we sampled all of these variables, um, but they all showed like one main trend. Um, first, we'll look at the total basal area of the trees, which is just the amount of area that a tree takes up. Um, you can see that there is a difference between all four landscape types we could see. So this would be plantation forests that were planted in naturally forested areas, um, natural, natural forest, natural grassland and plantation forests planted in these natural grassland areas. And they're all different. And this difference shows in tree density in the average crown area of the trees and the total canopy cover of the trees. Also same different differences were seen in the shrub species abundance um, in the average tree size, there was a big difference. We can see that the natural forest, the tree sizes are much bigger in natural forest and there was no trees in the grasslands. Um, tree death was much higher in plantation forests, but it differed between all types also. And the rock cover was much higher in natural landscapes. Takeaway from all of these variables is that this ground truthing revealed extensive differences in density, canopy cover, and species composition, which overall is summed up that these four landscape types are different. Um, and this actually supports the visible patterns that was seen by the monitoring group in, while they were doing their work with um, concrete scientific ecological evidence. And then our last takeaway is going back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of the project, what can be done in the future with the biological monitoring group of Milpa Alta. Um, when we were doing our initial geospatial analysis, we used a lot of Google Earth imagery because it's a lot, it has a better spatial resolution so you can see more. Um, and it's also free and a little bit more accessible. So that can be used by the group Mexico for continued geospatial work. We also, like I said before, need some more points for sensing classification. So the more thoughts from the field that we can data about whether or not they're plantation versus natural or um, any of friends' ecological data points. We could gather some more information on those that could be helpful. And then lastly, plantation forests are continuously expanding as more and more trees are being planted. So we continue the ecological monitoring that is in this project.
just want to take a minute at the end to thank all the lovely people that helped us with this project. Um, our faculty mentors were Dr. Fernando Galihan Rodriguez, Dr. Marcus Hates, Dr. Sapano Alhani, and Dr. Robert Rose. And then also, of course, the wonderful team. Logical monitoring group of Northern. video um that our partners um so it is in spanish so we have a, a rough translation here in english on the right so you can follow along Como grupo monitoreo biológico en Paisa, hemos aprendido que el conocimiento es esencial para conservar a nuestro territorio y que la colaboración con otros lo engrandece aún más. Gracias, Evelyn Udin, por su interés, compromiso y pasión con el que trabajaron aquí. Sabemos que los resultados que obtengan ayudarán a esta lucha por conservar a lo que más amamos, que es nuestro territorio. El idioma es distinto y no fue impedimento para conocernos y compartir el pan, la lluvia, el sol, que los problemas se solucionan si trabajamos en equipo. Sin más que decir, deseamos de corazón que sus vidas se llenen de bendiciones. Gracias y hasta pronto. Next up, we have Andrew Lee, who worked with professors Greg Hunt and Robert Rose and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to explore deep learning approaches to monitor sandhill cranes. Um, hi, everyone. I first want to start off with a short video, giving a little bit more background about my It's the largest gathering in the world. Sandal cranes migrating over the Platte River Valley in Nebraska every spring. And imagine yourself out in this field trying to count all the birds <laughs> that are flying in this migratory scene. It purely sounds impossible, but can this be solved? Um, hi, my name is Andrew Lee, and I'm working with the U.S. Special and Wildlife Services to enhance sandal crane monitoring using remote sensing and deep learning techniques. So what exactly is remote sensing? Um, remote sensing um, is a process of acquiring data without having to uh, physical contact with the species of interest. Uh, deep learning is a subset of machine learning where you leverage large, large raw data to make predictions on whatever you're interested in. And we want to combine these techniques. And the reason why is that we want to reduce observer biases that are happening when we observe these cranes. And also mainly to reduce human labor that goes into this process. And all of that allows us to rel um, collect reliable data um, through nighttime surveys using thermal imageries. Um, the main theme of this project is to move upon a demonstration study that was conducted last year by one of our IIC alumni, Emilio, to make it into a scalable deployment that we can use it in the wild next year. So we moved from a 40 images from last year to making predictions on approximately 46,000 images. And the overarching goal of my research can be broken down into three parts. Well, first, we improve a deep learning model um, that we that is existing and uh, improve upon its accuracy. Second is to scale this model to process over 40,000 images um, so that we can complete a, conduct a complete survey um, that year. Lastly, we want to identify key factors that are influencing the performance or specifically the generalizability of the model. Our first key finding is that we were able to improve the model with about 6.4% average error. And as you can see in the figure, um, the dotted line represents where the predicted 
um, number of sandal cranes and the true observed sandal crane meets. And as you can see, a lot of the a, a lot of our images lie within that um, line, meaning that we have a very high accuracy in terms of prediction. The second key finding was that we were able to successfully apply our model to 45,992 thermal imagery compared to the previous 40 thermal imagery that was conducted. And as you can see in the figure, the top image represents um, the predictions that was transferred to the GIS software, and the bottom represents um, us um, connecting all the thermal imagery into a landscape and having a distribution map of where the sandal cranes are originally. Our third key finding was that we were able to identify the key factor that was influencing model generalizability. And in this case, the object density was the key. Um, in other words, the number of cranes in each image um, had a high um, influence in the model's performance. As you can see in the bottom of the figure, as the number of sandal cranes increased from 600 to 1,000, our performance starts to drastically decrease as the images are deviating from this trace line. So what are the key takeaways and what can we, um, how can we use this information to solve our conservation challenge? First is that we showed a lot of the three of the state-of-the-art object detection models showed remarkable accuracy on aerial thermal images. Secondly, we identified important image feature, specifically the density of the image, affecting model performance. And using these two key takeaways, now we can conduct a full model inference on next year's data. The US Fish and Wildlife Services do a annual conducting survey um, in the spring of 2025. Lastly, I want to acknowledge our um, faculty mentors, Dr. Gregory Hunt and Dr. Robert Rose for helping me throughout this project. And of course, our conservation mentor from US Fish and Wildlife, Bradley Pickett. So I think we have Brad Pickens, um, Andrew's mentor, joining us via Zoom. Can you hear us, Brad, if you'd like? Um, yes, can you, can can you confirm that you can hear me okay, Erica? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, great, thank you. Um, so I just want to say it's been a real pleasure working with Andrew um, and all the aspects of this project. Um, he quickly adapted the new software uh, starting on day one and, and contributed to the various aspects of this project. Um, that includes the, the survey itself, but also uh, really leading an experimental, uh, experimental research on deep learning. So for the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, the project of Fully and Mary has really taken us, as, as Andrew mentioned, from a small demonstration project to a fully fledged operational wildlife survey using artificial intelligence. Um, it really sets a, an important precedent for the future and it says that yes, we can do this. Um, so that, that's really great to have in our, have in our, our pocket here. Um, the products of this research are already beginning to be used in an investigation to habitat use and management. So this is very much applied research. Um, and the experimental research um, has also showed that we can uh, really depend on these deep learning models to uh, be, be accurate year after year. Um, it also helped us uh, show how we can more efficiently produce AI models by um, sampling appropriately. So uh, many thanks to Andrew for all of his efforts in this project. Next up, we have Haley Santella and Sophia Politi, sorry, Politi, I'm so sorry, who work with support from Dr. Don Swaddle and the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources to explore strategies for promoting wildlife vehicle collisions in Northern Virginia. That was pretty loud. That was pretty chaotic. So imagine you're a deer or some kind of animal trying to cross that. That is what we were trying to fix. My name is Sophia Flea, and this is Kaylee Santella, and we are studying how to mitigate wildlife vehicle collisions in Loudoun County, Virginia. We are working with the IIC and the Department of Wildlife Resources um, to do this. Specifically, we in the US have uh, 1.2 million wildlife vehicle collisions that occur annually. This has a high economic cost. It has a high um, human uh, 
safety concern as well as a wildlife safety concern. And it is due to rapid urbanization and um, uh, which causes habitat fragmentation, and which can be addressed by modifying mitigation structures, which apply less pressure on individual ecosystems by connecting these habitats, which are often disconnected by roads. But at first, we have to think about two major things. How are we going to build or modify these structures effectively so that wildlife will actually use this? And what would be the best strategy to encourage wildlife to use these structures? And for context, when I mean mitigation structures, I mean structures like underpasses, culverts, and fences. And so like I said, effective mitigation structures, they need to be designed based on animal behavior and their preferences. And their uh, behavior, I mean like their prey and predator dynamics. For example, a prey like deer would prefer a bright open space area, such as underneath a underpass, where the predator like a fox would prefer um, darker, narrower sp spaces and tunnels to cross over like a culvert, as you can see in these images. Um, another factor is size and disturbances that we need to look after are sun and noise exposure. And so now that we know all of this, we actually need to know which species are present at these sites in order to inform decision-making. So I conducted a camera trap study in Loudoun County at these prioritized mitigation sites with high um, levels of wildlife vehicle uh, conflicts, uh, collisions, um, to measure wildlife presence and frequency at these existing structures. I also conducted preliminary recordings to measure noise, and I later on de designed a streamlined and effective data processing workflow. For our context, this is Loudoun County, and the red streaks are the high uh, wildlife vehicle uh, collisions in the area. And so we measured uh, the sites were at one, six, four, five, and three. And so my key findings are from the camera trap study, just key statistics, and then how I used AI and community in the community to process all of this data information. information. So over eight weeks, I took about, I took way too many photos, 80,000 photos, and processed uh, and identified 3,499 individuals, and with the most, of course, being deer, which is actually really important to know about in this area because deer are a main common factor in wildlife vehicle conflicts, so that is really important to know for later decision making, and I did I processed all this information using Wildlife Insights um, AI assistance, that helped me filter out all the blanks, all and assisted with a bunch of the um, wildlife classifications, wild species classifications, and overall it was processed it processed this data so that it was very easy to analyze later on. I also used this crowdsourcing website called Zooniverse to leverage the community volunteers in the area uh, to help me process all this information. Due to the way uh, the verification system that is built into the Zooniverse. The information is actually really credible. It's also fast processing because we're using uh, volunteers and it was very easy to set up in general. So my main recommendations from this study is if you have a small project with a short time period, then it is really good to use Wildlife Insights. But if you have a large project with easily identifiable species like mine, um, I would recommend using Zooniverse. And just in general, I would recommend engaging with the community, both in the design aspect of a camera trap study and the um, and just like uh, data processing in general. All right, so buckle up, everyone, because now we are facing a new challenge, pun intended. So, how do we get Sophia's data to actually become an implementation strategy? So my research is really aiming to bridge the gap between data collection and implementation. And I'm doing this by designing a framework to engage all the different actors within the decision-making process. So specifically, currently for Loudoun County at the local level, level, there's no clear guiding document or framework that tells a conservation interested actor how to navigate through this process, specifically with the end goal of the mitigation structure in mind. So that's what my research is aiming to address. So this summer, I did interviews of the um, 
I did interviews with the primary actors, analyzed the barriers and motivations, examined the community influences, and I used all of my findings to develop an original framework. And like I said, I did that primarily through interviews, and then I also did a literature review as well. And so a few of the key insights that I gathered from my interviews that's, um, that are going to be into my framework are involved actors, jurisdictions and authority, funding, and community support. And diving a little bit deeper into each of those. So it's really, really important to understand who is going to be involved in this process and what would make them say yes or no to your project. So I interviewed people from each of these um, organizations. And depending on how you navigate the decision making process, the, these are going to be the main actors that I'm going to include in my framework. Um, and so I talked to each of them and I'm going to include a lot of those motivations within the framework as well. And then zoning policies are also a critical thing to understand. So it looks relatively simple, but whether a road is owned by the county or VDOT can change how you would navigate through the process. So you'd really want to understand once you have your um, the location where you want your mitigation structure or strategy, you want to understand who owns it. And then, so during my interviews, most of the people who I talked to within the process said that funding and different priorities are the primary goals to actually getting a structure implemented. So they either said that there's a lack of funding altogether, or they have the funding and it would go to a different projects such as road expansion, road repairs, pedestrian safety, or stormwater management. So it's really important to keep in mind that even if you have supporting data, there are a lot of barriers to get through before your project could actually be implemented. And so these would also be included in my framework. And then lastly, Community support plays a huge role in effective implementation. Um, you want to engage with the different constituents, especially when you're dealing with decision makers. Um, and almost every single person who I talked to said the biggest motivating factor for them was community, community advocacy and getting the community supported. And tying it back to um, um, collecting data, which Sophia did, is if you can involve them in the process from the very beginning, there's a higher chance that they'll advocate for and support your project. And so if you want, it's a really, really good idea. And I recommend to get them engaged from the very start of your project, even with data collection, all the way through the implementation stage. And in conclusion, you really want to identify who's going to be involved, understand the socio-political landscape. So what would make them say yes? What would make them say no? And understand the relationships between the different actors. And then community engagement is really key to winning um, decision makers approval for a mitigation strategy. Um, and then one point I really want to drive home is this is really important in the beginning stages of the project because you don't want to have all of your data, have your structure that you want, and then go and just not even know how to navigate through the process. So that's what my framework is really aiming to achieve and collect all of this information to one place that a conservation interested actor can utilize. And then this is our amazing research team. So we have Jordan Green, who is our conservation partner, Eric Garut, our research program manager, our faculty mentors, Dr. John Swaddle and Dr. Matthias Lloyd, and our previous student researcher, Alexa Busby. Fantastic job. Um, so this project really was launched last year by William Mary to Alexa Buffy with support from Dr. Matthias Liu and now has grown into a, a much larger project really demonstrating an integra integrative lens to real conservation challenges. So we have a reflection from uh, their mentor, Jordan Green, um, who's a district biologist in Region 4. And he, he writes, roads represent an ever-increasing threat to wildlife and human lives, as well as dis diminishing quality ecological systems by disrupting habitat and habitat connectivity. Haley and Sophia's contributions to addressing wildlife vehicle conflict in Northern Virginia are, major are a major foundational component to what conflict and to what coexistence with wildlife in the natural world will look like across the Commonwealth and behind, beyond. Certainly, the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources cannot tackle important wildlife is issues such as wildlife vehicle conflict alone. Only through partnerships like this with William & Mary, citizen scientists, nonprofit organizations, municipal staff and leadership, as well as other state and federal agencies, can we address these complex issues at a, lar at a larger community. On behalf of the Department of Wildlife Resources, I want to express our deepest gratitude to Kaylee and Sophia, for their hard work, dedication, and shared passion to address this critical wildlife issue. 
This work started with the research led by Alexa Busby and Professor Matthias Liu that paved the way for this important work. And I wish all the best Haley and Sophia's academic and professional careers ahead of them and hope to one day work with them again. We have two more presentations before food and the reception. Next up, we have Ali Otto, who worked with Dr. John Swaddle and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to explore ways to mitigate nighttime lighting on bird populations. Good afternoon, everyone. On my project, I worked with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to understand the overlap between artificial light at night and migratory birds. When you hear the word artificial light at night, you probably envision a map just like this, with the majority of the light being concentrated in high, highly populated cities and areas. However, this is not always the case. Right here, you can see the image on the left is a satellite image of the Gulf of Mexico and New Orleans during the daytime. And the image on the right is that same image, but at night. And you can see that all of these small dots here are offshore oil and gas platforms that are emitting enough light to be picked up by satellites. And when we first started looking at some of these images, I noticed that some of them were brighter than the area that I live in at home. So this, is a, this poses, poses a huge threat to migratory birds and we wanted to explore if and when there would be overlap between those patterns and the, the structures. So the first thing that we know is that birds migrate over these offshore environments during the spring and fall seasons and billions of them migrate at a time. The second thing that we know is that artificial light at night poses a threat to migratory birds as it can cause them severe disorientation and collisions that the majority of the time result in um, severe injury and ultimately death. The other thing that we know is that humans use these offshore environments for a variety of activities such as oil and gas platforms, cruises, defense, the transportation of goods, all of those things produce artificial light at night. So the question is, where is this overlap and is there any at all? So the first thing that we wanted to do was to refine our study area and we decided to focus primarily on the Gulf of Mexico as well as the East Coast of the United States just because those areas are known to have high bird traffic during peak migration times, as well as a lot of offshore activity. From there, we then selected eight focal species to focus mapping their migration patterns on. We tried to select birds that were declining in populations and that would be or are currently on the birds of conservation concern list produced by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So the first thing that we wanted to do was identify and characterize human activities offshore. So which activities are going to pose the largest threat due to their artificial light at night and where are they? The next thing that we wanted to do was to understand those major migration patterns of those focal species that we had selected. And then from there, determine if there is overlap between those two things. So to do that, we first produced a map of the offshore activities that we had defined as being of the largest threat to migratory birds. So the first thing that you can see here is those red dots along the Gulf of Texas and Louisiana. Those all represent offshore oil and gas structures. And all of those lines represent cruise routes from five of the most popular cruise companies in the US. And then from there, we created a map of the bird migration routes of the species that we had selected. And then we wanted to overlap them to determine where there was that overlap between those offshore activities and those migration routes. And here's the result of that. So as you can see, the blue area represents those high density bird areas. And the red area represents where all of those offshore oil and gas platforms are in the US. And the yellow and the orange represent cruise traffic. And as you can see here, the majority of the overlap between offshore human activities and migratory bird species is in the Gulf of Mexico and around Florida, and a little bit up towards the northeast of the United States. So our key findings here were that there are significant, there is a significant amount of overlap between offshore human activities and those bird routes in the Gulf of Mexico and the east coast of the United States. 
And based on that overlap, we're able to determine that the light emitted by these activities is likely posing a huge threat to those migratory bird species during peak migration time. So in collaboration with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we are currently producing recommendations to give to those two industries that will allow them to reduce their impact on those bird species. So we're going to provide them with information on uh, migratory bird patterns, so when and where they're migrating, so they know um, what times of the year they could dim their lights to reduce their impact. And then we also wanted to talk about what they could do realistically to turn their lights off. So turn their lights off, have automatic timers, shield their lights, things like that. And the other thing that we wanted to include in those recommendations was how the attraction of birds to their structures could be uh, could negatively impact their specific industries. And I, finally, I'd like to thank my conservation partner, Joanna Lumberding, with her for her support during this project, as well as Dr. John Swaddle and Eric. Today's mentor, Joanna Lumberding, sent this reflection. Every year in the U.S., billions of migrating birds become disoriented due to light pollution during their nighttime journeys, and many other wildlife species are also affected. Light pollution is a multifaceted problem that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is tackling in collaboration with several, several partners. Ali's project takes a fresh perspective by focusing on offshore light pollution, an area that hasn't received as much attention compared to onshore issues. This type of light pollution complicates the already significant challenge of navigating long distances during often exhausting multi-day flights over open water. Allie has quickly grasped the difficulties light pollution poses for birds and has made valuable contributions to fostering a growing network of partners dedicated to emitting offshore light pollution for birds and other wildlife. We at the service are thankful for the chance to work alongside the College of William and Mary's Institute for Integrative Conservation, as well as with Allie, Dr. Swaddle, the past year. Collaborating with Ali has been both impressive and humbling. She truly shines like the stars in the night sky that we aim. We made it. And last but not least, we have Alina McCullough and Luke Solly, who worked with fellow student Micah Dill, Dr. Mara DeSenta, and the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center who explores explore stories of fishing communities related to river herring, the Rappahannock River. So we wanted to start just by asking you to think for a moment about the stories that you hold dear and the memories that you hold dear to yourselves that connect you to people, nature, and places that you care about. It was kayaking on Lake Matoka with your college friends, fishing with your grandpa. Maybe you associate your fondest memories with a particular house or river or town. Our project in partnership with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center is about recording and learning from people's stories and memories just like these, specifically with regards to river horticulturing restoration in the Rappahannock River. Now, we're not only working to restore river herring populations, but to restory herring, helping communities recover and preserve context, narratives, histories, knowledge, and memories about these fish and their relationship with people that may otherwise get lost. The spring runs of river herring have historically been extremely important to humans and animals alike. The massive annual, annual influx of herring swimming upstream to spawn providing people with the opportunity to catch, eat, and also preserve them for later seasons. River herring populations, as you can see from the graph, have been declining um, for some time. It was initially caused by early European settlement with mill damming, changing shapes of perennial streams, and then large damming infrastructure projects in the 18th and um, the 19th and 20th century, new age fertilizers from the 60s to the 80s, and finally predation by invasive species like the blue catfish from Louisiana. This decline has led to a moratorium of fishing being placed on um, river herring by the VMRC in 2012. The decline and moratorium have influenced communities who have historically fished herring, no longer allowing them to access seasonal runs. In attempts to restore herring's historic levels, many organizations have become involved, mostly centered around survey surveying populations, as well as large-scale dam removal, like the dam removal in 2002. 
Respiration effects, unfortunately, have not necessarily brought herring back. However, there is now an emphasis on understanding and tracking stock numbers to determine the state of population level. Beyond this, our involvement with learning local perspectives is a key to determining both root causes as well as solutions. At the center of our research is local ecological knowledge, or LEK, and this is the beliefs, expertise, and practices that over time while interacting with their local environment, ecosystem, and ecology. This could be something like a fisherman's observational knowledge of seasonal changes in the fishery or a farmer's experiential knowledge of local soil conditions. Our objectives for this project were twofold. First of all, to gather and record local ecological knowledge, learning about local histories, stories, and people's perspectives on river herring. And second, we aim to preserve and share that LEK partnering with holders of that knowledge to evolve conservation practices in the future. <laughs> to gather LEK, we conducted four of three interviews for this center, building on last year's existing archive by the previous student researcher, Emily Johnson, to reach 21 different participants in total. Then we conducted ethnographic analysis to identify key themes, trends, questions, and knowledge. So first, we found that herring played a key role in many older generational uh, people's connections to the river and to the local ecology, as they could remember a time of herring's abundance. People's sense of place, their feeling of home, and belonging, and kinship with the river and local ecology are closely intertwined with herring, human interactions with the fish, and the general health of the river and streams. We also found that people still care about river herring um, in a couple different ways. We talk to people involved with dam removal to make it possible for anadromous fish like herring um, to travel upstream to spawn unimpeded. We also heard from a local ecologist who was actually brought to tears discussing the loss of fish and other species in the world. We also interviewed a waterman who gets semi-frequent calls from customers asking when they'll be able to buy river herring again after the morning. And we interviewed a seafood processor who has a list of eager customers spread across the U.S., but many of whom grew up in the Rappahannock region, who immediately buy up his limited, expensive supply of herring roe once a year when he comes to work. One oral history participant last year let us know that, quote, the best fish to salt is herring. Without a doubt, there is no comparison to the herring. For effective place-based conservation, engaging with these varied dimensions of care for herring as an ecological partner or as a favorite childhood food is crucial to understanding the multifaceted human relationship. For many, the spring was built around fish migrations, family harvesting, with many people saying streams so thick we walk across them, like the sheer number, and now it's, uh, it's much less. Um, as many participants claimed Herring and fishing cooking parties serve communities up and down the east coast of the United States. One participant described fishing events where you could see campfires and hear conversations up and down the river as the herring arrived. You know, mentioned filling up an entire pickup truck bed uh, herring using uh, fishing methods that's, that's common there. However, today with the loss of population and impeded migration, much of the knowledge from the last thousand years of herring migrations and the practices around it are being lost. And people are wishing to once again enjoy herring products like roe or pass down fishing traditions like tools like the dip net, and they're unable to do so. Our project contributes to a growing body of work uh, on the importance of alliance and equitable collaboration with holders of LEK for conservation of species, environments, and cultural knowledge and practices. Moving forward, more research and analysis is needed to practically implement uh, changes to restoration strategies in partnership with LEK holders. I also wanted to briefly draw attention to the image on this slide. This was actually painted by one of the three participants of the project. So the final stage of our project to be completed in December is launching our website, which <laughs> is living and expanding archive of oral histories and a small museum of the human herring. Those artifacts and art graciously provided by our oral history participants. We'll also be submitting an article for publication in the Essex County Conservation Alliance annual magazine, a publication local to the area that many of our participants are from. 
by making herring stories and knowledge from the Rappahannock River more widely accessible to the public, the scientific and conservation community, and the communities that LEK holders themselves belong to, we want to work towards shifting the paradigm for how we legitimize and value ecological knowledge in the conservation space and pushing for partnership and equality knowledge holders. We also wanted to thank our faculty mentor, Professor DeSenta, our partners at CERC, Matthew Ogburn and Henry Leggett, our fearless and unwavering CRP coordinator, Erica, <laughs> um, the ISC for funding this project, and the previous student researchers who we are building on a body of knowledge by, uh, Emily Johnson and Paul Hugo. partner reflection today comes from Matt Ogburn from CERC. I want to express my sincere thanks to Elena, Mike, and Luke who work on river herring with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. Their efforts to document and share people's connections with herring are vital to our understanding of how science can inform future restoration and conservation efforts. I also had fun driving around Virginia for a week, having good conversation while listening to Luke's soundtrack. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Oh, it has been an incredible day. Uh, we have so many amazing stories of student-led research that we had to break up this presentation this year into two sessions, a morning session and an afternoon session. So please join me in giving our students, partners, and faculty a round of applause for all this incredible work. It really does take a village. Um, I just really, again, want to thank all of the partners for their willingness to engage students and help with all travel logistics and to host all of our students and to demonstrate what it looks like to be in the conservation field doing integrative work that has impacts on all of us. Also, the faculty, thank you for all of the time and energy that you put into mentoring these students. Um, I know it's, it's just been incredible to learn from all of you, and um, thank you for everything. Um, the students, congratulations, you're not done yet, though. Um, we're finishing reports over the next month, but congratulations. Um, it's really been a pleasure to get to get a chance to get to know all of you. I'm very impressed with all the work that you've done, um, and I'm also very impressed with who you are as people, so it's been amazing to work with you. Uh, again, to the IAC team, you all are amazing. Um, I think this work would not be as fun if we didn't have such an amazing team. Um, quick shout out to Palabi and John for all your help today with all the logistics, especially. And Kathy Francilla, I don't think is here as the one behind the scenes, really all the time doing all of the work to make this possible, all the research, um, travel logistics, et cetera. That's really Kathy in the reception already. So, and then finally, thank the I, I would like to thank the broader IAC community. Um, this work really wouldn't be done without all the community members, alumni, parents, everybody who's really been here to support the students and help shape the IAC over the last four years. So next we have a reception. I'm actually gonna ask our students to sneak out first what, because what? they have, oh. It would be the person that keeps you from getting to the reception okay. a little quicker. Because we have one more very important thank you, and that's to Erica. <laughs> Erica, her leadership on this project, that we've grown from four summer projects to what you've seen here today. This incredible collection of mentored student projects that are leading to conservation solutions around the world. Erica does everything for this project, from the daily reminders to all of these students to answer your darn emails, which you <laughs> often don't listen to her, to working with our partners, refining the projects, and really making sure this program runs throughout the year. It's an incredible effort, and the IC is a huge debt of gratitude to all her work and leadership. So thank you. Can they go? Thank you so much, Rob. Yes. So the students, uh, please sneak out, grab some food, and then if you find your posters, um, kind of hang out around those so people can find you to ask questions. Let's see about that way. And then I love a few yeah. slides as they get ready for you. Go ahead with this one. Yeah. Yeah. Self historian. Fabulous. Yeah. 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 
Oh, 